Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name is Jeremy Gilbertson. I decided to go buy some new light, and now I'm trying to figure out how to make myself not look shiny. Uh, with me, as always, is Mr. Mark Fielding across the pond, my good friend. How are you? Hello. Doing? Yeah, shiny, happy people. Yeah, your face is beautifully shiny. Yeah, great. Good to be here. The highlight of my week, as always, the thinking on paper. Um, yeah, before we get to our incredible guest today, I just want to talk about two former guests because I've been um, in a couple of days ago, I had an amazing conversation with Nolan Ether, who probably will be in the chat. And if Rachel, our guest, doesn't know Nolan, they should definitely connect after the show. I'm not sure there's many people in the world who are thinking as creatively about AR brand experiences than Nolan right now. So we had a great conversation about that but more than that and you're like this me and him are both writing a children's book and we're both writing a screenplay and we were just kind of banging our heads together about storytelling and how you accommodate storytelling frameworks from the adult world into children's books like what has to change in like the hero's journey if anything what happens what has to change in how you set up the the drama and the conflict in children's story how that has changed i'm sure that's something you've possibly thought about so well it's um, it's interesting that you know the story side of this is that you know you you get a complex idea a technology idea idea for a business a product an app you always are you always have that one person that say you know explain it to my grandmother or explain it to my third grader right so right. you know children's stories i would imagine i've never written one before but like thinking about how to simplify it but make it elegant at the same time that should translate into all kinds of writing goals right yeah essentially not really changing much of the idea of a story of a story structure about what makes it engaging what draws you in what keeps you in what the emotional impact of it where it is i guess i mean the stories we're writing they're not for very young kids they're like seven eight nine ten so they have a lot of emotional understanding of the world so perhaps you don't need to really change anything well emotional understanding but maybe less baggage right yeah like as adults <laughs> we have baggage and it's it's proven that our that our divergent thinking capability goes down year after year after year if we don't work at it right that's why you know a lot of us lose our magic when we get older picasso you know said had a famous quote that talked about that but um that's awesome that's awesome so you're all you're doing is writing a screenplay in a children's book well I would, yeah I would that, look that, that, that's just on the side yeah. on the side my day job is just writing about web3 in the metaverse and ai increasingly and um, there was a very interesting tweet from another former guest theo Priestley. and if people don't follow theo on twitter they x they should follow him um i'm sure you've heard about the big what's the big story of the week like GPTs and he asks a very good question about how GPTs are well I I think they're personally they're just productivity apps on steroids really but he he wants to know how they plug into like these legacy infrastructures that we all have it's very very well these apps kind of designing a strategy for you but they can't actually implement anything because they can't connect and communicate via the existing system so that's quite an interesting thought a lot swirling around for sure. And then, you know, how much, you know, as, as tech gets easier and more accessible, are we going to get stuff that's less cool because it's easier to make now? Like, that's what I always yeah. kind of think about it. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Right? So we're going to have this deluge of like not cool stuff. And then we're going to need technology to filter the cool and the not cool. And yeah, it's a cycle. But anyway, I, well, I want to, I want to dive into a couple quick things. Number one, we have a pretty exciting announcement. Um, Mark and I are, uh, preparing to start a book club believe this or not so we had a guest that was uh here uh very recently that has a book called the nexus so what mark and i are doing we've bought the book <laughs> and we that? are actually reading it and every friday we're going to go through uh chapter by chapter and put out a three minute we're going to try and keep it to three minutes which might be difficult three minutes uh on what we what we got from the chapter because reading is great right but it's very, you do it by yourself, right? So to yeah. unpack ideas like we do at Thinking on Paper, we're gonna try that as a new experiment. So stay tuned for that. And uh, before we introduce our guests, wanna thank our awesome sponsor, Ripple, with a W, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, Marketing's On Demand Talent Platform. You got a project you're looking to flex out with resources in the latter part of this year. They're great. Uh, Mark and I are actually solo solopreneur freelancers. 
uh, whoops, wrong way uh, on this. Uh, so if you need our skill set, we're up there as well. But over 3,000 individual, very talented contributors. If you're looking to stack a team to make something happen, thanks to Daisy and Ray and Ripple. Without further ado, we have Let's a go. very special guest today who is joining us very early in the morning. Thank and you. we are going to talk about something called a super experience or what I get my head around as a super experience, right? So we have real life in-person experiences that generate high emotion. Like us as an audience, when you think about an audience, it's just like collective, um, collective Expensive. means of generating emotion, right? And directing emotion, that sort of thing, sort of thing. So how can we pull the magic out of the live world and trickle it and dust it in the digital world. So Rachel Noonan is with us today, uh, strategy officer, Forward Studios, an amazing history uh, and intersection of art, tech, and all that fun stuff. Rachel, thank you so much for being here today. How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you for having me. Pretty stoked to chat with you guys. Very cool. Well, give us a, give us a quick little cast so we can we could uh, give our audience a little bit of understanding on your background and where you're coming from. And then we'll dive right into this idea of super experience. Sure. Um, so my background is, is, <clears throat> excuse me, arts, entertainment and technology. <clears throat> it's, it's really, um, I would say anchored in, in storytelling and, and filmmaking. Um, I've worked at film institutions um, like TIFF and, and Tribeca and, and uh, institutions that help support and, and um, establish the careers of, of filmmakers and writers and producers and interactive um, narrative prototype designers um, at the Canadian Film Center and um, it helped launch streaming services. So I've been on the commercial side, um, going through the process of you know innovating and, and shaping new technologies. Um, and me and a few um, crazy cats run an agency called Forward now. Um, there's a small group of us and we're really focused on experience, product and service design, um, intent entertainment, and we focus on emergent technologies and how web two and web three connects. And if it should really, because technology for technology's sake is, um, oftentimes a fail for consumers. Uh, and we spent a lot of our time on, um, immersive experiences around, uh, film and, and music. And, um, yeah, that's, that's me. Amazing. And you know, forward, uh, forward was put together. Um, well, I, part of the folks that put it together, I guess, Sam, who is, is one of the partners and founders, uh, did a lot with mm -hmm. Coachella's, you know, AR activation, you know, kind of blending the physical and digital world. I'm sure a lot of mm -hmm. people have read about that kind of work and that work really extended into the formation of forward, right. With you and a bunch of other folks. Yeah, Sam um, was really integral in identifying and seeing this opportunity for uh, expanding essentially story worlds. And, and the story in that situation was really Coachella. The physical barriers of the festival um, had limited the growth of the fact you could only fit so many people into this global destination, you know, expand to two weekends. Okay, that, you know, what do we keep doing more weekends? Well, you know, there's all these amazing spaces, the Fortnites of the world, um, you know, whether it's AR, mixed reality, um, and then working with technology partners to help realize what that can look like. So um, he, he realized this was, you know, not a lark, not kind of a moment in time. It was the evolution of a business. <clears throat> and then um, a few other individuals were feeling the same way and we also were just extremely passionate about certain sectors and although there's you know really amazing companies out there servicing multiple sectors you know healthcare auto etc we just were like obsessed with the the entertainment space and um and have really dug in there um so we're working with uh, clients like universal pictures and and then other brands within their portfolio um to help not just on the um you know the irl side and taking that digital um but the convergence of digital to physical around you know the future of content and how you're discovering it what does your online identity look like when you're um, developing, you know, profiles within your, your content ecosystem of watching uh, film and television and, and games. And how does that all swirl together? Um, and should it swirl together? So it's, it's been pretty exciting. Are there certain stories that are more, uh, that, that can live in those two different worlds, like this, this mm -hmm. blended world 
or mm -hmm. is can can any store any really good story live in both places digital and physical no <clears throat> so i remember a long time ago uh, you know i was working with a pro an interactive narrative prototype program and it was almost as if it should have just been called agnostic where you know an individual a storyteller a creator comes in with an idea or a narrative and then you figure out what platform makes sense because you know a traditional linear narrative um, is intended to have a pov a, a, you know an individual's interpretation of the story and the experience and you know you're, you're experiencing it passively um and then there's gaming right and then there's larping and then there's there's all these different modalities of story um, and some is about uh, me, you know, and my ability to define the narrative. And those um, use cases or experiences tend to be looser. You know, they'll they'll be protagonists and, you know, they'll be heroes. But uh, oftentimes in those experiences, you're the hero when it becomes more participatory. And um, the first interactive narrative film I was involved in was about I want to say 25 years ago, which really ages me. Um, and it's called Late Fragment. It's a very small independent film made in Canada, funded by the National Film Board, an amazing institution that puts money into helping creators figure out where these stories should live. You know, should, you know, my pilgrimage to my motherland be a VR experience or should it be a book, right? What, what, is, what does that look like? Um, but what happened with those tests, because they really are tests, is that people um, tended to not want to interact. So, it, you know, in that situation, it was very similar to Bandersnatch, <clears throat> which was a you know, film that Netflix put out, uh, which was a good film. And it was a choose your own adventure for, you know, for lack of a better example. And a large portion of the people in the films that, you know, I've worked on want a passive experience because the nature of the story and what you're doing is really intended to be a passive observational. And it, you're going to ideally experience it emotionally. And it's the cinematographer and the writer and the director and, and lighting person, you know, set designer's job to, ex, you know, to emit and, and create that emotional connection. So I think that's one of the biggest opportunities right now because there's so many storytelling uh, mechanisms and you can, um, bring you know certain story narratives to life in unique ways i saw a, a use case that was a magic leap example that was so beautiful and it was a storybook brought to life in um 3d ar so you you have a traditional book it's flat it's physical and as you turn the pages you have the the glasses on and the story comes to life it's it's multi-dimensional you can see through it so you're reading it and you're seeing it at the same time and it enhanced and didn't hinder the experience so you weren't disrupted um, and you could go back and forth as you wanted uh, the story narrative had um, a bit of interpretation to it which was quite lovely um, but it was done very simply and they looked not to necessarily augment but enhance the experience which was interesting couple quick things that I was thinking about uh, that, that are super important. One is the, the participatory aspect of things. Mm -hmm. And the other one is the, you know, technology kind of can't get in the way of the experience thing. So let's, let's hit mm -hmm. one of those at a time. Uh, you're right. Not a lot of people want to do any heavy lifting in the experience of digesting content, right? So mm -hmm. how, what would you say, and I know it's hard to pull the universe, but just it, it, if you just think mm -hmm. about it in general, how many people do you think want to put effort into a, a story that they are that want to actually participate versus man i worked 12 hour day i want to throw on netflix and just kind of mm -hmm. get pulled into something that i don't have to think about um i don't know if you have ever watched the world's um competition opening ceremony for esports <clears throat> for any of the esports um competitions but um, they feel almost, you know, biblical <clears throat> in nature. The music, the entertainment, the, this is, and this is, I would say, one of the most phenomenal use cases of, of blurring the lines completely. And I think a lot of the gaming community is kind of laughing at, like, you know, some of the people coming from other story modalities is because they're in it. It's, you know, not been there, done that, but they're deep in this. And so you watch these ceremonies <clears throat> and there's bands that have that don't exist in real life and they have millions and millions of streams and they're performing 
as holograms or avatars um, on these stages. And they're good. I mean, they're obviously the real musicians. They're, you know, recording and producing in the background. But they've um, they've taken the embodiment of this like convergent reality to to new levels. So you, you're watching this performance of this band that technically doesn't exist, and you have all these individuals that are highly participatory in their story worlds, right? You know, wh whichever you know large esports gaming franchise you want to talk about, the fans are, are are fanatical. They're completely invested. They're writing poems to each other. They're in chats. They're on Reddit. They're um, you know, they're, they're on Twitch. It's, it's kind of baffling and amazing and inspiring to watch it. And those story worlds are theirs, right? Like the game designers and the people creating those narratives are putting, you know, texture to all of those characters, but you're allowed to be part of that story world. So though it's, it, it's by design, it's participatory. So trying to understand, you know, a concert versus a movie, and, and then a gaming world and it's blurring, right? The lines are blurring and, and a lot of it is, is failing. A lot of like the virtual worlds that are out there are empty. Nobody's traveling in them. Nobody's talking in them. Nobody's populating in them um, because the use case doesn't work. So there has to be um, a, a high level of participation or co-creation with the audience if you're going to design or build these and marketers every day or you know, they're sold this romance by a lot of companies to, you know, build in say Roblox or build in all of these places. And if you're just trying to get press, that's fine. Um, but if you're trying to like change the trajectory of your brand and create another channel where um, audiences can be part of your narrative and their narrative, you have to be really careful um, because it's out there, right? And obviously gaming, there's some really amazing examples of brands that have tapped into it and done a, a pretty legit job. Um, so, you know, looking those up because most brands are not doing it well. Um, and a lot of brands also try to go into gaming, create, you know, a game independent on its own, um, but don't design it with the community and it, it doesn't end up working. So, yeah, I mean, there's tons of use cases. Uh, you just have to understand what the audience actually wants from that experience. So they want to escape and and relax and fall asleep at 7.40 p.m. because they have four children and um, they desperately want a bit of time to themselves. Or do they want to put a headset on and do they want to play Beat Saber and do they want to be physical and do they want to get lost and do they want to meet people in that space? So there's, you know, going back to the core purpose of um, of the narrative is really important. Yeah, you know, that's cultural delineation, isn't it? I mean, the the people who want to go to bed at 7.45, chill out to Netflix because they've got four kids, aren't the same people. You know, it's a generational gap. Um, mm. It's not a zero-sum game. There's plenty of room for all of these. That's the beauty of it, that you can have mm -hmm. as, as as immersive as you like. You can be completely non-immersive, completely immersive. Um, I just want to sure. go back to Coachella before we go forward into designing super experiences themselves. Mm -hmm. Coachella was... I mean, how much did COVID help and how much did it hinder mm. with what you were trying to do? I mean, it's it's interesting because it, um, I mean, if I was to pick one, <clears throat> maybe helped, you know, to a degree because it, it definitely well, push people online, right? It increased adoption education. That was to a degree though, people that maybe were on the fence, right? They weren't heavy adopters of technology, you know, platforms, the Fortnites and things like that. But um, the pandemic really, um, you know, it, it had us dark as a festival. So all of the experiences, the mixed reality, the augmented reality, all the enhancements of the festival experience um, are there to, build on the, the physical, right? So, you know, there is like the Coachella verse in Fortnite, which is, is pretty amazing. And last year, and you know, the first couple of days we had, I don't know, we had millions and millions of people in, in that world. Um, and we'll, you know, we'll continue to build and, and do some of that work. Um, but it's, it was never built to be a replacement for the festival. Um, the, the live AR, is um, to build on the YouTube experience. So people all around the world that can't physically get to the festival, they can watch it all around the world. So we augment that feed 
so it's enhanced and fun and makes people feel closer to the experience and um, and more entertained. Uh, you know, with with Tribeca, where um, I used to work, we essentially you know moved as much of the festival online as we could have, whereas um, that wasn't necessarily a big focus or a remit for for Coachella and our augmented reality um, experiences. That's really participatory with the artists. Could there have been an opportunity to go exclusively online? Maybe, um, you know, that could have been an interesting process. But we saw with the last two years, I kind of called it a beta in a way of uh, living exclusively online and we don't want to, right? We want to date. We want to meet people. We want to hug people. We want to fall asleep in, you know, uh, camping tents um, at the festival. We want to show up and meet the creator who, um, you know, designed the experience on the headset. Um, we want to get away from our, our family sometimes. We want to miss yeah. our partners or, you know, um, get a little space. And those f festivals and conferences and activities all enable that to happen. So, um, but again, by design, if if they had decided, you know, if if um, the the organizers, like the you know the production uh, organizers, had said, you know, we're going to move this online, that could have been a really interesting opportunity, um, which may may happen in the future because as say Fortnite builds out and you know there's more people and and more convergence, then there could be an opportunity to continue to do that because that's what YouTube was like. YouTube, I want to say the deal the partnership is not maybe 10 years old um and it was revelatory when it happened because the you know the organ like a golden voice owns you know festival ag owns golden voice and they have this property this festival it's physical and you know they're being asked to broadcast it around the world which seems antithetical to having this physical festival, right? Because there's a supply and demand. And if you, you know, you um, change the dynamic between that, maybe you'll have less people at the festival, but it, it did the opposite because it acted as, again, like an enhancement to the physical festival. So it gave people a window into the world of how big and fun and, and, um, and unique the festival was. So they get a slice of it. You know, the festival gets more people learning and, and keeping the brand relevant around the world. And then we can play with that broadcast. So if you watched it last year, we did like Gorilla's AR. Um, we did some Bad Bunny um, augmented um, AR, which was really fun. Um, and it just elevated the experience altogether. Gorillas is the perfect vehicle for all of this, isn't it? In fact, from a music perspective, there's nothing. There's nothing, I mean, they 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 go back to your esports opening ceremonies, the band that doesn't mm -hmm. exist, but obviously it does exist. But they 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 are the front of um, what could be, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes, and Stephen chiming in on the chat, uh, agreeing with us on a lot of this stuff. That that what what I think about um, physical to digital, being able to like extend some of the magic, not replace it, not altogether do something mm -hmm. different, but taking a little bit of that and bringing it to digital could open the funnel for some of those people that attend these micro experiences that are digital that may be like, man, I gotta, I gotta go to Coachella next year. Like this digital thing was great, mm -hmm. but I couldn't make it, you know? So how does, how does, ex how do extensions play into kind of funnel for new people attending the live events? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's the core, the core of it, you need to think about the audience on that platform. So when you look at the Fortnite experience, right, it's, it's built for and by the Fortnite audience. They, you know, really understand what they want. And it's, um, they're taking like artifacts and experiences from the physical festival um, and bringing them, you know, into that space. Uh, the discovery is, um, I would say, I don't want to say organic, but it's not um, like every marketing plot point in those enhanced experiences are marked out. So there aren't, you know, extreme, uh, you know, embedded links in everything to purchase tickets, right? So it's a, it's a soft, um, nudge if somebody is interested they can go to their respective social channel that they follow and they can learn more about the festival and pretty organically you know decide to come and to buy 
um, with, I would say, you know, with other kind of um, products and, and experiences and content experiences that were moved online, you know, when you get something like film or, or television, it's, it's just, it's easier, obviously, because, you know, you're watching, experiencing those on a platform, um, you know, fan forums and things like that are already established. Um, it, it's, you know, one part brand development, and then um, one part narrative development, which, you know, we, uh, I, I used to work at TIFF, and we had this amazing content team. And um, they built out and extended a lot of our social channels and, and the content was seemingly quite traditional, um, but it, it worked and it um, expanded the brand to a larger audience, whether it was um, podcasts or um, ironically more long form content, which you you know think would be the opposite of what we would do to get more audiences. But um, that thoughtful uh Kind of critique and exploration of of story and and characters and stuff is something that audiences really wanted because they were getting bored of and sick of these like 15 second videos that were kind of hammering at this you know optimization structure which yeah. uh, a, a friend of mine calls herself a recovering marketer and she's a a futurist she's um, a super talented and skilled person and I'm very aligned with her in that you know you can create these amazing experiences that could in in their right be a new product or a new kind of narrative area because fortnite could i mean it's a you know a billion dollar business there's people playing and it's it's so kind of fascinating watching that audience so it can be a marketing channel and it could be a new business channel um there's a variety of things that could spring up from there and it's the same thing with you know the, the podcasts that we did at tiff and with Tribeca, it's a different, you know, different, I guess, experience, and it's very much there to support establishing and burgeoning um, filmmakers and immersive storytellers. They have the most amazing um, immersive program that brings in some of the most bleeding edge VR experiences. Um, but they're looking for commercialization, right? They're looking for for sellers and and places and spaces, and and a lot of them will never find it because. Um, there is an audience fit. The audience doesn't necessarily know what to do with them. Um, so when you're coming at these new worlds or these convergent experiences, if you come at it from a marketing frame of mind, you're probably not going to have as much success as you would necessarily want to. Um, you want to come at it with an understanding of you know what the what the audience wants. You want to really create value because then you endear them, you know, to your brand or your festival or your whatever your your product is. You have a job to do for the audience. So you need to figure that out before you're starting to design those experiences. So, so, but some things never change, do they? I mean, that's still it's always been like that. I, I, I mean, I guess yeah. maybe you have a. Um, now with so much diversity, you have to be even more sure and more certain and more in line with what your audience wants. Otherwise, the failure rate is just quick and gone. How many? How many brands? How many brands that you've that you've talked to? Like first conversation where they're like, "Man, we got to do something like with music and live mm -hmm. events or digital. We got we just got to be around music because they want to. They don't necessarily think about." they think about what music can do for them, but they mm -hmm. don't necessarily on the other side, think about what they can do for music. So how, uh, mm -hmm. how much coaching are you finding yourself doing on the points that you just mentioned with it's more soft touch. It's more of this, you know, ethereal presence, right? How do you, how do you advise mm -hmm. brands on that? I mean, assessing their needs first and foremost, like we're not as, as a, an agency, we're not a performance marketing company. So, we won't be, you know, we're obviously going to assess what their KPIs are and what, what their needs are, but we're at a, you know, certain part in the funnel. Um, we're not doing like performance advertising and, and things like that. So usually, you know, when we're talking to certain brands, um, we're helping them to actually redefine new platforms. We're in like the, we're in the product space. And then experience design as it relates to these new revenue generating streams so it's a really interesting process of starting with purpose you know what what's the purpose of doing this um because we work with a lot of entertainment brands the purpose is embedded in their product right they're delivering or they're creating 
content. And then for those that are adjacent, you know, or uh, CPG brands or brands that aren't directly embedded in entertainment, um, you know, again, like you said, is a lot, as much as things change, they stay the same. So you're asking questions about authenticity and, uh, you know, why do you have a right to be here? And when you have a brand, like an alcohol brand, <clears throat> an alcohol brand is, you know, it's, purpose is to provide you with a beverage to do a thing. And, um, and a lot of those products out there are parody products. So it's really a matter of, you know, what kind of investment you're wanting to make at the core of the identity of the brand. Are you about, you know, arts curation? Are you about art support? What's your, what's your way in? And uh, Red Bull is an example of a brand that leans in owns their own properties, develops and helps, you know, put the culture on their shoulders, whether it's um, dance or extreme sports. Um, you know, they they have, you know, probably one of the largest, you know, content arms of a brand of their kind in the world. There's probably others, but they do it in a way that there's a co-authorship with the audience and they've invested in a multi-year way that, um, doesn't appear as though they're, you know, just dropping in to show up at, you know, a festival or an event to try and capitalize off of that market, but they're helping to further define and grow it. I mean, dancer style with Red Bull is, you know, I would say it's a multi-million dollar, multi-year global program that allows dancers, you know, more money, time and energy to do what they love. And you know, they may not be propping up hundreds of thousands of careers, but they're definitely giving them a forum. Um, and that's obviously, I would say that's like the loosest narrative experience. Um, and I don't know if they have any, you know, VR or, you know, emergent technology experiences, but from a brand perspective, they're a really good example. They should have a few weeks ago, I watched the the Red, Red Bull Rampage, which is this mountain bike the extreme mountain oh, bike yeah. where they jump off jump mm -hmm. off zion park in utah they just jump it's just incredible to witness and even without having any kind of immersive experience just watching them do it is mind-blowing to have some kind mm. of immersive vr or ar experience to to ride with the riders as they jump off these cliffs would be pretty yeah. special um which is actually ties me so i had a conversation the other week about entrance points entrance points to the to the metaverse if you want I, I use the word metaverse there we go entrance point and one of the big hurdling blocks and what keeps people sitting on their sofa watching netflix with a glass of wine so they can't they don't want anything immersive it's all passive it's this kind of entrance point to it whereby mm -hmm. there is no quick easy mm -hmm. way to be there to experience it to know to be familiar with it and then and that moved on to essentially this it was a big chinese brand and they're waiting for the the Vision Pro. They're waiting for spatial computing to become a thing because they see this as mm -hmm. this doorway, this entrance point into something whereby it removes the friction and it removes the the passivity mm -hmm. of having that experience. Is that something that you and you've seen the brands there, they're chomping at the bit for this as well? Is this something which, as soon as it becomes widely available and cheaper, is going to change everything or not? Mm. Have you, have you, um, either of you used the new headset, like the, the quest three with pass through no, nope. yet? Waiting for the info, the info, the pro okay. Jeremy saw that out. Yeah, it is. It is. So I remember the first time, you know, the first VR experience I ever saw was, um, was actually because my mom worked for a company called alias and they, um, were the first company actually they created were called Silicon Graphics. So what Maya was based on, which is you know most three D software is you know based on on Maya, and they created this VR uh, experience um, which was huge. It was like I don't know ten feet across, and it was a hang gliding experience. I was really really young at that time, and I didn't really get it. I didn't understand how insane this was and how cool this was. I just kind of was for me. I remember that moment and kind of going, okay, this is, this is really cool. And then the first time I, I experienced a void, there's a, a company that unfortunately isn't around anymore called okay. the void. And they made probably the most beautiful 
consciously designed VR experiences where also you didn't want to throw up. So they they solved a lot of problems with the experience. And I did the Ghostbusters game, and then um, and I went, okay, this is this is a game changer. Like this is going to allow people to play and understand this in a way that's really fun and immersive. And when I put the fir the first headset on and I experienced pass through, which essentially allows you to um, see in front of you, so see your physical environment, and then you lay on you know a mixed reality environment, whether you want to call it augmented reality or mixed reality, and it's it addresses a lot of the things that are keeping people off of a headset, which is nausea, which is you know being uh, discon literally disconnected from the people around you, um, which is a huge hindrance. Um, and a lot of people really don't want to um, they don't want to play alone. So uh, that is going to be a huge factor in the adoption of these devices. Now, you know, when you when you go into the Oculus store, it's it's rich, it's full. They've you know they obviously they've you know been working on this for a very long time, and they're really starting to perfect what's on there. And and now the technology is at a place in space where you can build augmented reality and headset um, feasibly and ship it and people can play with it. And sometimes it could be ambient, sometimes it can be participatory. If you um, were able to check out the, the Meta Connect um, event back in September, they announced that they were doing um, augments, which are going to be um, new mixed reality experiences when the headset ships. Uh, you know, two years ago, the tech wasn't even ready for it. Um, now, just because you build it doesn't mean they will come. Um, but in terms of, you know, a, a parent and a child or, you know, partners being able to put a headset on and to play a game um, in a way that, you know, actually connects people, we're there now. So what does that look like in terms of, you know, the how do you take um, a physical game and a digital game and converge it? And there's an example of that, which is, um, I don't know if y'all have ever played this, but it's, uh, you put the headset on and there's a physical um, instructions for participants in the room and you put the headset on and you can do pass through or not, um, but you're trying to uh, unplug a bomb. You're trying to you know save everybody in the room. And the individuals in the room have to interpret these instructions for you. And then you have to you know, unplug all the wires and stuff. And you're starting to see these like really thoughtful, fun. And yeah, they're, they're t tending to be games. Right. And then there's the commercial, um, you know, value of it, whether it's, you know, training or, um, you know, digital twin experiences and things like that. And that's a, you know, a different use case altogether. Um, but you know, why can't I put on my headset and have a cooking assistant next to me, an avatar showing me how to cook, you know, and you can, so you can do that with say YouTube, but your hands get all messy and you know, your peanut butter gets stuck <laughs> in the keyboard. Um, so it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's interesting because I, I don't know if VR is going to be the pervasive, um, platform that everybody thinks it will, but we are at a stage right now where, you know, you can conceivably build and ship something into really any of the, you know, headset um, marketplaces. And there is an audience that's interested in them. And now the technology is there where you can, you know, bring in API um, plugins, you can bring in, um, uh, you know, whether it's Llama for, you know, the Quest headset or other um, different kinds of artificial intelligence where you could have conversations with say an avatar in headset, which is kind of the embodiment of the future of search, yeah. right? So when you start to have those conversations and there's like a high, high level of utility, which is what the internet gave us, like VR is not the internet, right? The internet was pervasive, highly utilitarian and, and you know, there was, there was nothing like it. Um, whereas, you know, say with VR, other immersive experiences, we, we can still escape and watch Oppenheimer, right? So we can get our entertainment in different ways. And you can still use a PS4 or five or eight or whatever number they're at. Um, you know, you can use a Nintendo Switch. So there's a lot of competition um, for those kinds of immersive entertainment experiences. So it's gonna be an interesting couple of years because now the tech is finally caught up. 
Yeah, I the one the one thing. So going back to this idea of super experience, and this is just a just an idea that you know has been swirling around my head, and and it means like to me, it means how do we bridge these two in authentic ways to to get a push pull from both and the other, right? Digital into the physical, physical into mm-hmm. the digital, and and do it in a way that that resonates. But one thing I think that's missing, and and I'm wondering how quickly it will be figured out, is the idea of anything meaningful in the physical world, like say I, ha- I have a band that I love and you guys haven't seen this band before. I'm like, guys, mm-hmm. we got to go, we got to go to the, you know, we got to go to a venue and, and listen to this band. Just trust me. They're awesome. You're like, okay, oh, Jeremy, okay. You, you did this with run the jewels the other day. So what could you have done differently? I think if that's where you're going. Well, yeah. So, so kind of, so, so there's, there's a magic of number mm-hmm. one, me bringing you into something that I believe in. Right. Mm-hmm. And then we go, you trust me enough that we go to this thing and we're sitting there, we're having drinks, we're, we're waiting. And then there's a moment where the lights go down and we are no longer individual people. We are now what's called an audience, right? And this audience moves and shouts and, you know, reacts to what's going on together, right? Have you seen anybody that mm-hmm. started to kind of figure out, because you mentioned before, it's like you put a headset on, it's a very, very one person experience right um what do you think about solving that mm-hmm. problem have you seen anyone getting close yeah i mean there's a company um that was recently purchased they're called a uh, wave w-a-v-e and they were doing um virtual performances um they're doing a really great job they had a an amazing virtual production studio um and you you know get on headset and then you're ported into this world with other audiences well, they, they do the john, um, john, john legend and that, uh lindsey sterling or or yeah yeah that, that whole group yep yeah. yeah they did justin bieber they did yep. the weekend they've done i think selena gomez and um i'm you know blanking on who has acquired them but they um they really focused on the visual, the aesthetic of it, which was really interesting and, and bringing people together. And they did, you know, benefit definitely from, um, you know, people's migration online during the pandemic. Um, the, the the places and spaces that I've, I've seen it really um, shine has been in Fortnite. It really has because they have the audience, right? So this has been an interesting process of, of people trying to build virtual worlds. And I know people say you know, the Fortnites and the Horizon Worlds and, and other platforms, the Robloxes are different from Second Life, but um, you know, Second Life was a, a place and a space that people needed when there was nothing else like it, you know, and they could go on there and they could be weird and they could talk to other people and you know, have a high level of anonymity and, um, and they built community right so finding uh places and spaces where people are already there which is you know an interesting process is essential to the success of it and and fortnite has those people whether it's you know the the travis scott of it all um where that performance you know kind of broke the internet you had an audience on a platform that have a behavior and you have an artist that makes sense for that audience who comes on and and, and reimagines the nature of the platform. So they were playing, they played with perspective and, you know, made him giant and, and everybody was there and they could see each other. And um, I think it got as close to what, you know, Zuckerberg calls like, trying to really achieve the presence of, you know, being there with somebody, which obviously they're working on and making some pretty significant investments in. Um, yeah, I mean, I know you mentioned the sphere. The sphere is obviously a, a rich territory. It's a new physical venue that has a, a fully immersive 360 dome um, projection that uh, you can see when you're watching the show. There seems to be no bad seats in there, which you know I've not been, so I can't really say. Um, and a really large stage that can be modular and do all these really cool things. So that venue potentially lends itself to a connected experience. Cause what, what does that look like if, you know, you're putting a headset on and you can be side stage with the audience. Cause now you could potentially do that. And I remember during the, the pandemic, the NBA tried to physically beam people in and they created the fake, um, you know, stage uh, seating area. And uh, it, 
didn't work necessarily maybe in the way that they wanted it to. So um, yeah, I think Fortnite is doing it because there's people there. A lot of people have tried to do it. Um, but if you don't have a platform with a lot of people, then you have to pay to push them there. You have to give them a reason to go there. Um, and then are they just going there in the same way that you go to, um, I think it's called crypto.com arena now, uh, Staples Center. Um, I go there, I watch a show, I leave. I'm not staying there. So understanding of, about the transactional relationship of why people go to places, you know, people go to Coachella, the physical festival, they're there for a weekend and then they, they go home. So how does the festival travel with them? And that's something that um, we've actually worked with um, the Universal Parks team in terms of helping them to explore what it feels like to be at the park and to have fun. You know, I went to Halloween Horror Nights last week, at the LA park, and um, why can't I, you know, take it home with me? What does an augmented experience look like where I can talk to a character, I can get, you know, cards. And, and again, there's, you know, the Pokemons of it all. There's tons of use cases out there of these kinds of behaviors, which Mather, Magic the Gathering and um, different card games like that. How do you play and test and find different ways um, for all of that to come together? Um, you know, you wouldn't necessarily put a headset on and, and go to Halloween Horror Nights, but there's, um, they have Waterworld uh, experience. What does Waterworld look like if I wanted to put a headset on and be part of that audience? That could be really cool to that explore. MBA, that MBA. So just, sorry, Jamie. Um, I just got this thing about that. So the MBA during lockdown, they tried to bring an audience mm -hmm. to watch the game. Okay. So Jamie, your, your point, okay. Collective experience, film, TV, it's not a collective experience. You watch it on your own, you're in your house, whatever. The cinema mm -hmm. is okay to a certain degree, but it's a very small amount of people. Sport, a billion people watch the World Cup final. Okay, millions of people watch the, the Super mm -hmm. Bowl every year. Did the NBA miss a trick by doing that during when, when there's nobody in the stadium? If there was some way that they could combine that with a full stadium mm -hmm. and make that augmented exp experience for people who can't get to the stadium, and the stadium's full and there's already an atmosphere. And I think I know that Manchester mm -hmm. City have an, a metaverse, and a lot of football clubs have invested money into these metaverses to watch football games mm -hmm. communally. Is perhaps sport a way to take this to the next level and and and, and have Jeremy's point of kind of that collective yeah. experience of the physical and the digital kind of speaking to each other? My my neighbor is a, a hardcore football fan and he watches multiple games over the course of the weekend and I, I can hear him yell and you know I And I'm yelling here in, in and, France and Jeremy's uh, yelling there. Everyone's yelling at the same time at the TV. Well, it's 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 interesting. It's it's almost and like now, it's almost like if you had a headset experience, but what was beamed, like you're in section 104 around these actual people that yes. are yelling and doing the same kind of thing. Yeah, I think I think there's the one thing that you said, Rachel, backing up just a hair that I think is really important when you're talking about Fortnite, you talked about the platform where people are, right? So how do you get people to the platform, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, if you're outside of it and how do you make it easy for those people who are not used to it? The big thing that I pulled from your response there was behavior because the reason why Fortnite worked, people who were on the platform knew how to behave in the environment or knew how to, you know, get the most out of an experience like that. So I think to me, like behavior is a huge thing, right? Does the platform, does the community mm -hmm. know how to move in that world? And will they find benefit in experiences that you create to have them move, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and when you think about a sport experience, because so his behavioral, say your maybe behavioral ar artifacts for sport are, it's, it's you know, a, a beverage and food and and community right so those three things are these like artifacts of experience for you when you're watching the game and unless there is a a like a, a marked value for me to put a headset on and to you know eliminate people from the experience i'm not putting it on now if i'm on an airplane and i want to be part of the game and i want to watch the game and then i want stats so what are like ancillary pieces of information that can enhance and give me perspective. I want to know, you know, you want to know the history of the players, right? The, the, basically what the VO of, of a lot of the hosts are doing, how can that be digitized in a way that helps augment the experience? Um, sport is absolutely what, 
you know, these, uh, especially these, you know, the headset, the hardware companies are investing in trying to figure it out. It, it really, uh, the cautionary tale is the th 3D televisions, right? When the Samsungs of the world and bless all of them for putting money, time and energy into R&D and figuring out what does work, right? Because there's, you know, um, meeting existing behaviors and then there's nudging and evolving behaviors, right? And and getting us into the future and whatever that's gonna be. But I but, um, actually worked on the launch of a bunch of Samsung products many years ago and, and the 3D television was, you know, exalted as like the next stage of sport experience, right? Because it was a wrap around and it was super cool and nobody wanted it, nobody bought it. and because it really didn't overall change the sporting experience for them. Like they just wanted to hang out with their buddies and, you know, have a couple drinks and, and, and they wanted to socialize. So you need to, to take into consideration those behavioral aspects. If you're going to, if you're going to do it, if they want, and the thing is, is you can play Madden, right? Like that's the expression of sport in a headset is you play the game. Yep. No, that's amazing. Why well, I, I, you know, I think we could run on, like we always say for, for a bit, I wanted to um, be mindful of time and, and your day and, and with our audience as well. I think it's been a fascinating exploration of tangible examples of little experiments happening and how these experiments can kind of point us in a direction of, of where things are going. Where can our audience um, find more about what you're doing, what forward's doing, you know, where, where you guys are headed. Yeah. Tell us a little more about that. Yeah, just uh, forward.studio. Um, you can see a little bit about us and, and some of the work that we've done with, uh, with our clients. Um, we're really focused on platforms, actually new, new platforms and convergent platforms and that, you know, stitching together the web two and the web three, most of the, um, most of the, you know, snake oil salespeople and the smoke and mirrors of web three is, is, you know, starting to emerge and make it really clear what, um, what has been forced and what is actually coming forth as, as a utility and, and a use case for Web3 blockchain. And, and so we're trying to figure all of that out, um, what makes sense for clients. Um, and we're doing a lot of work around um, a really seamless, simple experience for audiences to just be part of their their fandom in a way that's that's frictionless again same word that was used you know 10 years ago we're just trying to remove fiction friction um and using web3 as ways to do it um and we're, we're gearing up for for coachella and um yeah so that's that's us thanks for for having me amazing mark great. we should do a live broadcast from coachella in well, uh in half half <laughs> uh augmented half real time no that's that's amazing well, i'd like that oh, that'd like, be fun. i have no experience so i, I spent a, i mm -hmm. went to a lot of festivals in in my in my younger days um but never american festivals so actually doing mm -hmm. something like that actually having the access to go and experience coachella on some kind of level um would be mm -hmm. incredible and obviously that that plays out in every music festival or event in the world i mean just being able to mm -hmm. i mean okay i don't want to go to a to thailand to see this i don't i don't know like whatever it happens to be for example or or to vietnam or australia or brazil but i can go and experience it to a degree of what it's like to be there on on a fraction of the budget a fraction of the time mm -hmm. whenever i want and there's definitely something to keep exploring with that isn't there i mean a lot. One of the the, yeah. the reoccurring things we talk about is the breakdown of geographical barriers and distances, and a lot of that is what this is about. Yeah, Agreed. amazing. So, Rachel, one last question for you. Um, as you as you make sense of this world, mm -hmm. this new world, this you know, we're always moving. We're all futurists as mm -hmm. we think about tech and culture and all of these things coming together. What's a great resource that you found, whether it's a video that you watched mm -hmm. or an article that you read? or someone that you follow that kind of like kind of cleared the fog off your lens, so to speak. Nice analogy. Oof, that's a good, yeah, it's, um, oh my God, this is a, this is an interesting one. Um, I would say, I mean, there's a, there's a futurist who actually was one of my professors, his name's Stuart Candy. 
Um, and he has worked extensively with multiple organizations, you know, from government all the way to entertainment. Um, and he plots and lines up, you know, what the future, you know, probabilities, um, prefer, preferred for ch futures, like the understanding all the different systems at play that are really defining what is possible in the future. Um, and if you look him up, uh, he's got a lot of methodologies. Uh, but the most important thing that I always lean back to is, you know, if you're telling a story, that's one thing. If you're wanting to actually, you know, create behavior change, 85% um, of our decision making is emotional. And if you take kind of a systems approach to looking at things and understanding everything that's involved in actually making something change and, and evolve and incorporating new technologies, and then the emotional nature of our behavior. And when we oppose innovation or you know we won't adopt something, um, fear is usually the underpinning of that, um, you know, being unfamiliar, not wanting to be judged, not wanting to be called out for not understanding this. So you stay connected to your existing, you know, platforms and, and behaviors and ways of doing things. So the horizon of evolution is, is extremely long. Like the first time I saw, um, a, a self scan grocery store was in, in Detroit, uh, 20 years ago at this grocery store called Myers, And I was mesmerized. I thought it was the coolest thing. I was like, well, this is just going to change the world, right? Like wh why am, why is there a person I can just do this myself. And it took 20 years, right? Before this happened, because there's humans and then there's infrastructure and then there's budget and, and, and all these different factors are at play. The first time I saw a, a Tesla charging station was probably 20 years ago and it was in California again, completely mesmerized. You know, the first time I put a headset on 15 years ago. So there's an arrogance that, you know, we think there's these new novel technologies and they're going to be adopted. Um, but humans are the things designing and creating them. So really understanding the associated systems and then our emotional barriers can help you um, be realistic about uh, how quickly the future is going to Wow, what us. a great wrap up. That was amazingly yeah. well-timed. Rachel, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us and uh, really appreciate it. We'll uh, we'll put some notes out uh, where people can find you and that sort of thing. So we're, we're um, very thankful for you to awesome. be here today. Yeah. Um, Quick little uh, final shout out to our friends at Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, Marketing's On Demand Talent Platform. If you need to flex out, stack a team to build a website, build a game, uh, do a marketing campaign, you know, lean into some strategy work. Uh, they do a great job of stacking interdisciplinary teams over there. Over 3,000 uh, qualified, vetted uh, solopreneurs. And lastly, where can you find us, Mark? Where are we? We are on thinkingonpaper.xyz. We're on YouTube. And as of last week, we're on every almost uh, podcast platform there is out there. So but the best place, thinkingonpaper.xyz. Check it out. We're there. And when you're checking out Thinking on Paper website, we do have our book club starting this coming week. Sign up for our newsletter. There's a link on the website. If you sign up for a newsletter, you will get our take on Julio Tino's chapter one of the Nexus. And we'll continue to break all of that yeah. stuff down. Sign up. Exciting. We'll continue to uh, explore the intersection of emerging tech and culture. Thanks so much for joining everybody. We will see you next week. Stay disruptive. Stay curious. Love it. Bye.